Hello, everyone. I have been enjoying reading Caesar's account of his conquest of Gaul. This is a fascinating read, and it just gives you a different idea of the ancient world because we have a conventional view of the ancient world in our society, in our modern society, but then there is the reality of the ancient world, which you can learn about by simply reading ancient books. I think a lot of people have this idea of the ancient world uh, that it was just full of these guys walking around dressed up like the characters from the movie Troy. Uh, and I, And I think that this conception comes from watching films about the ancient world or watching history documentaries and really i can't stand uh, these history documentaries it's just full of these lousy reenactments these just just lousy acting and all of the characters are dressed up like they're characters from the movie troy or they're from 300 or something like that and you know you'll you'll, you'll look up a documentary about Rome's war with the Gauls, and the Gauls are portrayed as cavemen, or they're portrayed as guys with six-pack abs and long hair, and they look like, you know, the, the, the typical caricature of a Viking, and it's just, it's, it's, it's quite different uh, from what you get when you read the ancient books. Uh, when you read Caesar's account of his conquest of Gaul, uh, he talks about how sophisticated they were. I mean, the Gauls had their civilization. For example, Caesar talks about this very powerful Gaulish oligarch uh, named Dumnorix, and Dumnorix is described as a very, very wealthy man, extremely wealthy man who had tons of slaves. He had his own private army, and he controlled the river tolls. They had river tolls. They had they were charging people to go through their rivers. Just imagine that. That sounds quite modern. It's like having to pay a toll to drive through a bridge or to drive through a certain road. They had river tolls. And this Dumnorix guy, he had all of the rights over the river tolls. And he made a lot of money. He participated in auctions. He married a very wealthy woman so that he could have access to the resources of her family. He even married his own mother off to a very wealthy man so that he could have that connection to another wealthy family. He was uh, very arrogant, power-hungry, ruthless. Now, if somebody wanted to make a documentary and they wanted to talk about Dumnorix, they would probably bring in some actor who looks like uh, Brad Pitt, dress him up like the guy from Troy and say, oh, yes, Dumnorix, you know, very powerful, a very powerful warlord. And here he is, long hair, and he's ah! <laughs> like some like some crazy barbarian. But I imagine him as being kind of fat. Uh, in those days, uh, fat was uh, a sign of wealth, somebody who had a lot of resources. Nowadays, uh, fat is... Uh, fat is associated with being lazy, being uh, disorganized, uh, not having your your stuff together and all this stuff. You know, go watch some Jocko Willink. Uh, but uh, in those days, being fat was seen as a sign of having resources, being wealthy. And women who were overweight, I mean, not... You know, I'm not saying women who have no chin or no neck, uh, women who have like 20 chins, but you know, women who were kind of fat were also seen as attractive because a little bit of fat was a sign of having fertility. Uh, you can look at some of these ancient uh, fertility idols from Europe, and it, it'll be of a woman who was quite fat, and that was a sign of fertility. And when you read about this Dumnorix guy, you get the impression not of some barbarian, but of a very ruthless, strategic, calculative 
man who was like the Elon Musk of ancient Gaul. I mean, they had their own Elon Musks. They had their own Jordan Petersons. They had their own Slavoj Zizic's. I can't pronounce that guy's name. They had all of these types of people in the ancient world. It wasn't... I don't think it was so alien from our own times as we think. Yes, we're better at technology, but as far as personalities and character and different types of talents that people exhibit and uh, in terms of wealth and, and poverty and people, you know, some people being very, very efficient at being at making lots of money, some people being very, very power hungry, some people just being average. I mean, they had all that stuff in those days. And, you know, today we talk about, you know, Jordan Peterson. We have all these different thinkers that we have. Back in the day, they had uh, Nietzsche and they had um, you know, all, all these different philosophers, Carl Jung, uh, Heidegger. Uh, then before that, they had Rousseau, all these different thinkers. I mean, they had that in, in ancient Gaul as well. Uh, so, for example, the Druids. You know, we always talk about people who are very interested in... I'm just making sure my mic is working. Uh, people who are very interested in magic or they have a fascination with magic because they play uh, World of Warcraft or, you know, they're into Lord of the Rings or whatever. Uh, they'll talk about the Druids and they'll say, oh, the Druids, you know, they were uh, the, this priestly class. And you'll probably watch a history documentary and it'll probably portray the, the Druids as guys walking around with hoods and uh, long gowns and you know, little wooden wands and all that. But, uh, you know, do you know how long it took to graduate as a Druid? It's very interesting. It took 20 years of education to become a Druid in ancient Gaul. What did you have to learn for 20 years to, to, to become a, a pagan priest? I imagine that they were learning more than just uh, magic and rituals and incantations. I imagine that they were taught in other skills. They were probably taught in uh, rhetoric, or maybe they were taught in politics. Uh, I imagine the Druids as being people who were very uh, politically involved, people who had a lot of political influence. It kind of reminds me of the Thirty Years' War. There was a cardinal in France his name was uh, Cardinal Richelieu. Very interesting character. Uh, here he was, a cardinal of the Catholic Church, supposed to be a representative of Jesus Christ, supposed to be a man of uh, the fruits of the Spirit, uh, having a meekness and kindness. But he was actually a very ruthless uh, political influencer. He had a lot of political advantage and leverage uh, and uh, strength. And he definitely had the ears of the government. During the Thirty Years' War, which was the most brutal war in Europe's history before World War One and World War II, uh, Cardinal uh, the French did not get involved in the war, uh, not immediately. They did not get involved immediately. They stayed out of it. Uh, but Cardinal Richelieu had the ears of the government, and he told the state, he told the, the, the royalty, whoever was in charge, to get involved in the war, and he said, join the war... But don't join the Catholic side, join the Protestant side. Why? Join the Protestant side, crush the Habsburgs, and then with the destruction of the Habsburg Empire, the French get all of that leftover territory. Because the French and the Habsburgs, even though they were both religiously Catholic, they were enemies. So here was a war between the Habsburgs and the Protestant uh, states in Europe, and Cardinal Richelieu says, no, 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 join the Protestants, crush the Habsburgs, and then take their territory. Very strategic, very ruthlessly pragmatic, and absent of all religious principles, even though he was supposed to be a man of religion. And I imagine the Druids were, were people like this, very uh, politically savvy. And I'll learn more about the Druids as I read through this book, I, I'm not finished with it. I'm only on page 55, so I got quite a while to go. Uh, there's some very interesting things in this book that talk about the different political happenings in the conflict. When you read that this book is about Caesar's conquest of Gaul, you know you automatically think, "Oh, okay, this is going to be the Romans, for, you know, fighting the the Gauls." And yeah, that's definitely the center of the story, but there's a, a whole bunch of other stuff that's happening. And there's another enemy afoot in the story. 
and it's not the Gauls, it's the Germans. Very, very interesting history here. This is what I love about reading ancient historical works as opposed to just watching some documentary about it. When you read, when you watch a documentary, you know, you'll get some simplified uh, perspective on the story. For example, I was watching a uh, I was watching a little bit of a documentary about it, about the the Roman conquest of Gaul. And at the beginning, you know, you have some historian who says something like, oh, yeah, the Gauls united together to fight against the Romans. And it's like, well, but they were tribes of Gaul who were allied with Caesar and they were loyal to Caesar. And they were Gauls who were being slaughtered by other Gauls. For example, there were all these different tribes of Gaul who were being slaughtered by the Helvetii. And then they went to Caesar and said, please help us, Caesar. We're being slaughtered by the Helvetii. And Caesar went to war with the Helvetii and defeated the, defeated that tribe of Gaul. So it's not like, oh, yeah, everybody was united. You know, maybe this will happen later on in the book. Uh, but from what I'm reading here, it, 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 the Gauls were actually quite divided. And uh, believe it or not, it, the division was very clear. Uh, from, what I'm, from what I've read so far, half of Gaul uh, was under the control of a tribe called the Edui. Now, the Edui, when you hear that word, Edui, I mean, it sounds very French, right? Like Edui. <laughs> Adieu. <laughs> Uh, so half of Gaul was under the control of the Edui, and the other half was under the control of another tribe called the Arveni. And I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. I wrote it down, actually. Yeah, Ar- 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 Arverni. I forgot the, le- the second R, Arverni. So half of Gaul was under the control of the Edui, half of the, the other half was under the control of the Arverni. And they were at war, obviously, right? They were at war, and they were fighting each other, and, and it was the Edui and their uh, allies, uh, and it was the Arverni and their allies, and they were fighting each other. So it was uh, a war between two different tribal coalitions. There was an ally of the Arverni called the Sequani. Now, that word, Sequani, it sounds like a Native American tribe, like, I am from the tribe of the Sequani. Sequan. I'm trying to think of a tribe that sounds like a Native American tribe, um, like Pawnee, like the Pawnee Indians. Uh, Sequani. There was the Sequani Gauls. So the Sequani Gauls, they were an ally to the Arverni, and they were at war with the Edui, and fighting was going on, fighting was going on. And the Sequani thought it would be a brilliant idea to hire German mercenaries to help them fight and crush the Edui. Oh, okay. So about 15,000 German mercenaries crossed the Rhine River and entered Gaul, and they helped the Edui defeat the... Uh, no, sorry. They helped the Arverni and the Sequani defeat the Edui, and the Edui were devastated. A lot of their noblemen were killed off. Uh, a lot of their knighthood was destroyed. They had, they had knights. I mean, it was just like medieval Europe. They had knights, and they had uh, uh, noblemen, and it was just very much like medieval Europe. And the Edui were dev- devastated. They were, they were utterly vanquished. But the Sequani, who hired these Germans, who invited these Germans, suffered more. The Sequani were also crushed by the very Germans that they brought in. And now the Gauls were being crushed by the Germans. Now they had to worry about German invaders. First, 15,000 Germans came in, and then after that, uh, the number increased to about 120,000. So now you're facing a huge army of warriors who were a lot more brutal than you were, uh, a lot more warlike. Well, I'm not sure if they were more brutal, because the Gauls were also very brutal as well. Uh, But the Germans were definitely more military savvy than the Gauls. They were very well trained. They had amazing military tactics, so much so that they absolutely horrified the Gauls just by looking at them. Uh, There's one account where some Gauls say that when they just look at the German warriors, just looking at them, uh, they were horrified and they were crippled by fear. Now, there would be another event that would parallel what happened in Gaul with the uh, with uh, the the tribes uh, being conquered by uh, the very Germans that they brought in to protect them, uh, and this would happen in Celtic Britain. The British Celts, who were the native population, they kept getting attacked by outsiders, and so they wanted 
a more warlike people to protect them. So they hired Germanic peoples to come and fight for them. And these Germanic peoples were the Anglo-Saxons. And the Anglo-Saxons came, they settled in Britain, they fought for the native population, only to later turn against them. And the Celts would be not only vanquished, but they would be exterminated by the Anglo-Saxons. And at first, it was just the Anglo-Saxons that uh, were invited to come to defend the land. And the Anglo-Saxons said amongst themselves that these uh, British Celts are all weaklings, and they sent a letter back home, and they originally came from basically what is today Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, and they sent a letter back home saying that these Celtic people, they are weaklings, but the land, the land is very, very fertile, so you guys should come. So more of these Anglo-Saxon people uh, settled in Britain, and their population became very large, and they would eventually conquer uh, England and exterminate the local, uh, the native population. So... Very similar story to what happened in Gaul. And the Gauls, just like the, the, uh, the, the natives of Britain, were also Celts. And they wanted the, the help of the Germans to fight against other Celts. And those Germans came, they fought for them, but then they conquered the very people that asked for their military aid. So, very similar uh, stories. They parallel, so much so. And they involve the same peoples. Celts inviting uh, Germans to help them, only to be vanquished and uh, enslaved by the very Germans that they invited. After Julius Caesar defeated the Helvetii, the, the Gauls requested a meeting between him and the tribal representatives. And during the meeting, you know, they, they gave Caesar some of their requests. And Caesar, Caesar was a very diplomatic guy. That's one thing... Uh, from from what I'm reading about him so far, I like his character. I mean, Caesar was very diplomatic. He was very seemed to be very reasonable, uh, very good military strategian, um, just a very well put together man. I mean, it's 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 he had a he had a solid mind. It seems. Now I heard that he also was epileptic, so he you know, like any other like anybody else, he wasn't um, perfect. So. Uh, then the then uh, the, the representatives uh, wanted a meeting that was very private somewhere in the forest, and they said we, we we really want this meeting to be absolutely private because we don't want anyone to know that we're going to tell you what we want to tell you. So Julius Caesar says okay. So he has this meeting, and uh, there is this one representative that represent that's he, he acts like the he acts as the spokesperson for the tribal representatives, and he has a private meeting with Julius Caesar, and he says to Caesar, he, t he, he says to uh, Julius, listen, we had a war, all right? It was the Arverni, and it was the Aedui. We were killing each other, and the Sequani really messed up. They brought in these damn Germans, and the Germans messed everything up, and now we're all under the control of the Germans. You really got to help us out here, okay? Reminds me of today. It reminds me of today, where you have the French, who are under the control of the Germans in the European Union. And what happened in the Second World War? Were the French not conquered and controlled by the German Third Reich? It's almost like history continues to rhyme. So Julius Caesar says, okay, he has a meeting with the representatives, and he says, I'm going to help you guys out. And he noticed that the representatives of the Sequani were all quiet. Their eyes were on the floor. They looked completely ashamed of themselves. And Julius says, what is the matter? And they don't say anything. And he continues to ask them. He continues to inquire, what is the problem? And they remain silent. And then the spokesperson comes up and says, uh, sire... These were the men who brought in the Germans, and they're utterly ashamed, and they know that if they tried to escape, the Germans would target them and slaughter them in very brutal ways. So Julius Caesar realizes, well, we have to fight the Germans. 
It's not just the goals that we're worried about. Because remember, and I talked about this in some of my uh, recent videos, Julius Caesar went to war with the Gauls when he heard that the Gauls, that the Helvetii, specifically the Helvetii tribe, was heading towards the province, the Roman territory in the south of Gaul. And he did not want a hostile tribe getting anywhere near Roman territory. But now he had to worry about the Germans. And Julius Caesar said that if we do not stop the Germans now, they will control all of Gaul. And soon we will have an entire Germanic kingdom ruling all of the region of Gaul, which is a huge region. You're talking about all of France, parts of Belgium, parts of Switzerland, parts of Germany. All of it is going to be controlled by the Germans, and they will no doubt, being so strong and having such a huge amount of territory, they will no doubt invade Rome. This is what Julius Caesar concluded. And so he realized he needed to fight the Germans. And so he began his war against this Germanic people that was in Gaul that terrified the Gaulish tribes. This was uh, specifically the Germanic Suebi tribe, and it was ruled by a man, I think his name was Audiovistus. And Audiovistus is, he is described as being an extremely arrogant man. Um, yes, Audiovistus. I just wanted to make sure I got his name correct. He is described as being a very arrogant man, very hofty, very loud, full of trickery, deceptive, uh, and very difficult to work with. So, for example, Julius Caesar requests a meeting with him. And this is an example of uh, Caesar's very controlled personality. Julius Caesar requests a meeting with him. And he acts very reasonable with Audiovistus. And Audiovistus says... If you wish to speak to me, you know where to find me. And if I wish to speak to you, I will go to you. So Julius Caesar is like, okay, well, where can we meet? And he says, well, you can meet me here in this location, but don't bring your army because I don't want you to trap me. You can bring some bodyguards with you, but they all have to be on horseback. Julius Caesar says, okay. So Julius Caesar had this army of bardyguards. It was called the uh, the Tenth Legion, I believe, or Tenth Cavalry. I think it was the Tenth Legion. And this these were the soldiers who were the most loyal to Julius Caesar in Gaul. And these were the soldiers that that Julius Caesar trusted in the most. He had the utmost of confidence in these men, and he knew that they would fight to the death for him. So Julius Caesar comes to the meeting. His bodyguards are in a distant position. Audiovistus' bodyguards are also in a distant position. And they have their meeting. And of course, Julius Caesar is doing most of the talking because Audiovistus is playing this game where he's not saying a lot. And you know how you know how they say when it comes to you know power dynamics in a conversation, they say that the one who is the most silent, the one who uses the fewest amount of words is the one who's most in control. That's a very common thing to say. It's not always the case, by the way. You can have somebody who is just absolutely full of shame and guilt, and they don't say anything, and they're obviously not the ones in control. So I don't think that's the case every single time. But Audiovistus is playing this game where he's not saying much, and Julius Caesar basically tells him, look, you know, you and here's another thing. Audiovistus was not alien to the Roman government. The Roman government knew who he was. In fact, he was given the title of friend of Rome because Audiovistus had a bunch of uh, requests from the Roman government. The Roman government helped him with these requests. And Julius Caesar says, look, Audiovistus, we're friends. You are, you are a friend of Rome. There's no need for hostilities. There's no need for, for, for war. Uh, all I ask is that you do not cross that 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 your men do not cross in large uh, large numbers uh, the the Rhine River into Gaul and attack Gaul. It's all I'm asking you to do, right? And also, you need to release the Gaulish uh, prisoners, the the Gaulish hostages that you have. And he says, I'm not going to release the hostages, uh, and uh, I will be peaceful to the Gauls. This is what he says: I will be peaceful to the Gauls as long as they pay taxes. So it's basically, basically nothing's going to change. Like they're, they're going to pay taxes to me as they always have. 
And uh, if they don't, then I'm going to go to war with them. I'm going to kill them. And uh, during the meeting, somebody comes to Julius Caesar and says, Julius, uh, Aristo, uh, 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 Ariovistus' men are attacking your guys. So Julius Caesar runs. He goes to his men and he finds out that the Germans have been throwing stones and spears at them. And Julius Caesar does not tell them to fight back. He says, do not throw a single stone or missile in return. Because we do not want to give Ariovistus the excuse to argue that we attacked his men during the meeting. Even though Ariovistus' guys have broken the rules, we're not going to break them. Because we don't want to give him any excuse to speak against us. That takes incredible emotional control. That takes incredible control. In fact, when word c came to Julius's army that Ariovistus's men had broken the rules, they were even more enthusiastic to fight against the Gauls because their guys got attacked and weren't allowed to fight back. So it's 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 very interesting his his personality he had the, he had this i guess you could say stoic way of thinking right like is it strategic is it like yes we can attack them yes we can probably defeat them but will it serve a purpose and so that puts strategy and utility over pride and uh the emotional desire to get back at somebody for wronging you. And that takes a lot of control. And Julius Caesar obviously had a lot of self-control, just reading about him. But it's a very fascinating book. I'm going to talk to you guys more about it as I continue to read along. Uh, very fascinating book. I started reading this book because, well, two reasons why. One is because I've noticed that there is a richness in Greco-Roman literature. When you read books today, there's a lot of... Authors today love to get into word salads. They love to use a lot of words in one sentence, and it's all, like I've said, it's all verbal masturbation just to show how smart they are, blah, blah, blah. But it's just very exhausting for the reader. And a lot of times they'll use, they, they will arrange their sentences in ways that are just annoying. And sometimes also within these annoyingly arranged sentences, they will use words that are not commonly known. I mean, again, it's nice to know new words, but they like to do it in a way that's sometimes they can be excessive about it. Like, for example, there was an author named Steve Cohen. I, I talked about his book in one of my, uh, in some of my uh, prior videos. He wrote a book about you know, some of the history of the, of the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union, but he'll do these sorts of word salads. And a lot of authors will sort of, you know, they'll play this game of using word salads. And you'll learn some new words, but don't really learn an abundance of information. You'll learn some new words, you'll learn some facts here and there, but there's, it's not this endless river of knowledge. And one thing that I don't like about a lot of modern writing is there's a lot of generalities that are used. A lot of generalizations are used to describe historical events. Instead of giving me details and quotes and specifics and giving me names and telling me the details of things that happened, they'll just give you a, a sentence that just generalizes an event. And then I have to go on Google and search it so I can learn more. And it's like, well, I would just rather learn a lot by just by reading the book that's the purpose of the book the purpose of writing a book is to help people it's to um it's to enrich people with knowledge like for example when i wrote my book on christian militancy i mean that book is i think over 700 pages or so and i spent years writing that book because i wanted to make a clear case for the fact that christianity is about warring against evil and I showed the history and I showed the quotes from all these monks and church fathers and uh, historical texts from ancient from from the ancient times of the Christian religion. And I really, really wanted to help everyone who I wanted to help anyone who would read my work. If you read my work, you will get really a complete argument for the for the militant spirit of Christianity. So 
I started reading Josephus, and I read his history on the war between the Romans and the Jews, and it's just endless knowledge. It's endless knowledge and quotes and names and battles, and it gives you the reality. The conventional view of the Roman Jewish war is that it was just Romans fighting Jews who wanted freedom from the Roman Empire. But you get a completely different image in Josephus. Yes, in Josephus' history, they are Roman, uh, they are uh, Jewish rebels who want to fight against the Roman government because they believe in creating a free Jewish state. But there's so much more that was happening. There was this huge civil war that was happening. And it was so bad. Most of Josephus's book is just about Jewish uh, political factions slaughtering each other. And you don't get that really so much in the conventional view of the Roman Jewish War. So I read Thucydides's uh, history on the Peloponnesian War. And again, it was very satisfying. There's quotes and there's political intrigue. And then you read about this, this civil war that happens amongst the Greeks uh, in which you have uh, uh, basically uh, the, the the poor doing a, a class war against the rich and people are slaughtering each other and you have family members murdering each other and I think sons murdered their fathers and I, I think by the, the, the opposite of that also happened. Like There was just a lot of killing, right? So much killing. And 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 you get an idea of the ancient world and how it wasn't so different from today. And you get an idea you, you get this image in your head of an ancient version of the French Revolution. So I, you know, I, I was very satisfied with, I was very satisfied reading Thucydides, and so I began uh, playing Elden Ring, the video game, and I thought, you know, I should read that book on Gaul, because Elden Ring is this sort of mythological, it's a game that takes place in this mythological setting of Europe, and that's what it is. It's Europe. But it's done in a mythological way, like Lord of the Rings, where you have dragons and you have trolls and witches and knights and soldiers and cavalrymen and crossbowmen and archers and all that stuff. And you're fighting knights and tree sentinel knights and all these different types of cavalry. And it's and so it's like Lord of the Rings. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to read that book. I want to I want to learn more about ancient Europe. So I started reading this book, and that's that's the other reason why I started reading this uh, this uh, account. So I'll talk to you guys some more about this history. You guys just heard some theology. God bless.